So in that context, we have made this video to understand what is G20, what is the origin, what are the strength, what are the weaknesses, what are the issues and what is the future of G20. We will understand comprehensively about G20 in this video. Namaskar, welcome to Plutus IAS. Myself Vikas Gupta, a faculty of Polity, Economy and PSI in Plutus IAS. So today we have brought a video on G20. As we all know that India has the honor of hosting G20 this year, that is 2023. So in that context, we have made this video to understand what is G20, what is the origin, what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses, what are the issues and what is the future of G20. We will understand comprehensively about G20 in this video, starting with membership. So G20 has 19 members, that is 19 member states and one is a custom union known as European Union. Combining all of them, it becomes 20. That's why we say G20 has 20 members. Actually, it is 19 states. One is the European Union, which is a custom union kind of thing in Europe. Having said that, now comes the origin. G20 originates in a very specific context of international politics, that is the domination of G7. G7 is a grouping of the most advanced nation of the world, including countries like US and Japan. So it is basically a US centric grouping. Over time, since independence of India or 1950s May, when the world got decolonized, so there was a demand, particularly by country like India and China, that we also want the power. That is, we are now the powerful countries. China is the second largest economy. India is the fifth largest economy. So we were demanding, we also want share in the world governance, particularly world economic governance. In this, you need to understand what is world economic governance. The world economic governance is dominated by a framework known as Washington Consensus. Washington Consensus are 10 principles that originated in Washington, USA and that has shaped this world. That's why we always say in IR that we live in a world made by US, sustained by US. Be it United Nations, be it IMF, be it World Bank, all are brainchild of US, including G7. So the demand from the developing countries, particularly India and China was, we also want part of this world governance. And so, in order to appease this country, because there was a fear among developed countries of G7 that these developing countries who are now powerful countries, they can form their own grouping. And then there will be two groupings in the world, G7 advanced countries and the G developing countries grouping. So to avoid this kind of clash between two groupings, developed country thought, why shouldn't we bring these powers on a platform? We will be there, we will dominate that platform, but these powers, India, China, Russia, these small powers, they will also get a glimpse of power. Uh, usually it happens now when you do not want to give power to your sibling, but you create a mirage. So that is G20 started in that context, a mirage to bring developing countries on board. Okay, that is the prime origin and immediate event was ASEAN financial crisis. ASEAN financial crisis was a hot money crisis. Hot money is the money that immediately comes and immediately goes out. So ASEAN faced an economic crisis and then we also know the 2008 crisis of started in the US. So these crises basically made G20 more significant. It was founded in 1999 after just ASEAN financial crisis. But after 2008 global economic crisis started with the US in a subprime loan crisis, the G20's relevance is ever increasing. So that is the thing we had. Plus Donald Trump. Donald Trump when became president, he tried everything to dismantle a US world order, including he tried to dismantle and he even uh, criticized G20, G7 members. So ultimately, G20 kept on increasing power. So this is the world politics of G20. Having said that, who are the ex officio officer? Because I told you, this grouping is a primarily economic grouping. Understand this, it's an economic grouping to decide on the world economic affairs. So of course, the Chief of IMF and World Bank are also present in G20 as ex official members. Apart from this, what is the joining criteria? There is no formal joining criteria. Whatever the G20 members may decide time to time, case to case, the person may be included or may be even excluded. So far, no one has been put out of G20. So it is to be seen what happens there. So we, this is a dark area or gray area so far. Having said that, summits. So summits, first summit started in Washington with head of states, in Berlin with finance ministers. 
and the current summit is in Delhi 2023 now the most important part about G20 analysis is G20 a failure success what it is and what India wants from it that's the most important thing we need to understand first analysis analysis mein Jashri Sen Gupta she is a researcher at ORF Observer Research Foundation it's an online platform also so she has published a very comprehensive article delineating about G20 in that she has highlighted some issues with G20 the first and the prominent issue she found is that there is dilution of agenda G20 was made as I told you in the beginning of the video it was made as a part of world economic governance but over time G20 is being burdened with various issues they are talking about everything ranging from Ukraine war to climate change to this and to that that was not the purpose of G20 it should focus on world economic governance how to make world economic governance just because world economic governance is highly biased in favor of developed countries they shape narrative they shape value and the remaining of the countries are just subjugator of the western ideas so G20 should focus on these kind of issues economic issue rather than strategic issue political issue environmental issue but nonetheless as we always know as Ghanam Medal has said every economic decision is political first so it's an economic grouping with political tinge that you can see next no follow-up according to Jashi Shin Gupta because G20 does not have a secretariat secretariat is a kind of bureaucracy it helps Malatne, the, uh, all the leaders comes and have a discussion they arrive at some conclusion that that is published after the end of G20 in that they list some goals but who will follow on those goals who will verify that these goals are being observed for that you often have a secretariat having a proper bureaucracy but there is no secretariat no bureaucracy here and that is why the entire burden of success or failure of G20 lies on the presidency Every year, some other country have a presidency. This year, for example, India has a presidency. So the success of this year's G20 lies on India's shoulder. India will shape the narratives. India will shape the values. India will shape the agreements. And the, would there be a follow-up? According to J. Shri Sen Gupta, the history of G20 tells there is largely no follow-up. Maybe one or two follow-up, but majority of the follow-ups are not there. So second issue. First is dilution of agenda. Second is no follow-up action because of lack of secretary. Third, G7 prominence. According to Jashi Shen Gupta, as I told you in the beginning of the video itself, that it was created by developed countries to persuade the developing countries to come to a same platform. And of course, G20 dominates. Why they dominate? Because there is a fundamental truth of international relations, as said by C. Raja Mohan, that in world, we listen to the arguments of powers rather than the powers of arguments. So that is the thing, if you are a powerful country, your arguments are heard. If you are a weak country, nobody cares. Same thing you find in all agendas. Be it Paris Agreement on Climate Change, be it SDG Goal, be it WTO, be it World Bank, be it IMF, be it UN. All institutions are dominated by world powers. They control them, they decide them. Same is G20. G20, mein, according to Jesse Singh Gupta, G7 has the prominence. And it controls largely the narratives. The, the last point, the fourth point is, rise of populist and authoritarians according to Jashi Shin Gupta this G20 platform is now becoming a club of authoritarians authoritarians means a leader who does not give liberty to its people in public life and they are rising in power this is not a failure of G20 but this is a phenomena we are seeing over the board in the entire world the rise of soft dictator as we call it Soft dictators which are rising around the world, be it Donald Trump in America, be it Victor Orban in Hungary, be it Duterte in Philippines and you know different kind of countries. These leaders are rising, they are authoritarian leaders, they do not give liberty to their people. That according to her is the biggest problem with the G20, it is now becoming an exclusive platform of authoritarians and dictators. So these are the some issues which I could find according to Jashi Shen Gupta. Now we will come to the next most important dimension of G20, significance for India. Why we should be happy about G20 this year? Because India has the presidency and I told you G20 does not have a secretariat and so the presidency decides what will happen. India has got a platform this year where the world media will focus on India and in that scenario India can shape narratives 
This is what we call soft power in IR. What is soft power? Soft power is a power of attraction. It is different from hard power. Hard power is, for example, I put a gun over your head I can, and I can make you say anything, make you do anything. On the other hand, if, for example, you love somebody, then that somebody does not put a gun over your head. But yet you shape your identity, your behaviors, just because you want to be with that person. That is the power of attraction, the power of love. That is soft power. India holds this year presidency and India can use this platform to enhance its soft power, the power of attraction. The people around the world will come, they will see India's culture, they will see India's beautiful tradition of unity and diversity. These all things provide India a very good platform this year, indeed a very significant event. Apart from that, India has always envisaged itself as a global power. That is what Sri Raja Mohan has said. Sri Raja Mohan in his in his work has argued that India sees world into three concentric circles, the so-called grand strategy of India. In that, there are three circles. The one is the immediate neighborhood, then the extended neighborhood, and the last circle is the world. According to Sri Raja Mohan, in the last circle, India seeks primacy. Primacy and so India seeks primacy and the status of a global power. And this G20 provides a very good platform for India to project itself as a global power. So two very important significance, soft power and global power. And the last thing, the last significance for India is India can use this platform to raise the concerns with respect to Washington consensus that I told you in the beginning, the 10 principle that originated in US Washington that is the fundamental foundation, the philosophy of the current global economic order. The current global economic order, the so-called globalization that you call is based on Washington consensus. So India gets this opportunity to shape narratives of Washington consensus in which India can input that the developing countries also need a place in the world, particularly in world economic governance. So these are the significance G20 holds. So we have analyzed G20 in comprehensive context with this. One thing that I would like to say as a concluding remark, the mother of democracy, indeed we are. The mother of democracy hosts G20. It's a very joyous movement, a very good platform. I hope the government uses it well and to project India's soft power, which will help India in the future endeavors of IR also. With that, Jai Hind, Jai Bharat. Thank you.